Chat with Traders, episode 57. The biggest secret of the best traders in the world is that they're just like everyone else. However, they've worked hard to learn the markets and discover what works and what doesn't. But how can you hear about these journeys and get in on the strategies and tactics they use? You can do it by listening to Chat with Traders. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. This week's episode of the Chat with Traders podcast is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Trading Technologies' new TT platform was designed from the ground up to be the most accessible, scalable, and high-performance platform for professional futures traders. To learn more, go to trade.tt now and sign up for a free demo account with Trading Technologies. All you need is an email address, so visit trade.tt now and sign up for a free account in just 30 seconds. What's happening, guys? You're listening to episode 57, and thanks so much for joining me. I have a really cool guest on the podcast this week. His name is Jesse, but in the Twitter sphere, he goes by Psycho on Wall Street. Chances are you've probably seen him around. A couple things you should know about Jesse he made $500,000 in 90 days trading marijuana penny stocks and then lost it all just as quickly. He went from part-time to full-time trading and for now has returned to part-time trading. He describes his approach as a hybrid between a day trader and a swing trader. His motive for trading is to one day open a fully functional no-kill animal shelter, which I think is incredible and props to him. We discuss all of this and much, much more during the interview, including a deep dive into Jesse's trading approach. Now, if you have any questions whatsoever for Jesse, go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash 57, scroll to the bottom of the page and leave a question in the comments area. Jesse will be watching closely and answering any questions that come through. So go ahead and take advantage of this. All right, let's cut to the interview. Here's my guest, Jesse, or like I mentioned, you may know him better as Psycho on Wall Street. Hey, Jesse. How's it going, man? It's going good, man. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm doing great and uh, good to hear. So let me say thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I have a great feeling this interview will resonate with many traders listening, especially due to the fact uh, you've only been trading a few years now. So you're still very in touch with the challenges that newer traders experience, which I really like. So this is probably a, a good point to start. Let's talk how you very first got started trading. So what was your introduction to financial markets? And also give us some context about your background prior to this. Okay. Yeah, sure. So my, my background prior to this, um, I've, I've kind of a checkered career path. Um, I was a, a janitor um, at a Winco um, in Moscow, Idaho for um, a couple of years when I got out of college. And uh, then I was a hay buck for a couple of years and drove a truck um, and uh, just, you know, did heavy equipment. And then uh, eventually, I, I, I have no idea how it happened, but about uh, seven or eight years ago, um, I, I found myself in the software industry and uh, just really got into it and started teaching myself some things. And um, that, that, and that's what I do today. I'm, I'm still in software, mainly in disaster recovery. Uh, replication, uh, things like that. Um, and so I, I still have a full-time job as I trade. Um, and, uh, as far as, you know, how I got into trading, you know, my, my first exposure to the financial markets was, um, from my parents actually. And it was a, a, a bid, a big red flag telling me, no, don't do it. It's too much risk. Just put your money in savings. And so for a long time, um, I never had any desire uh, to learn about it, but uh, it, as it happens, I had an intern, um, and uh, he had just mentioned to me one day about some stuff called Tesla, and this was back in the summer of 2013, and said that his dad bought a, a bunch of Tesla and it was going well for him. So I pulled up, you know, Yahoo quotes on Tesla and saw it was I think it was like a, a hundred and some a share at that time, maybe a little bit more. And, uh, then I just forgot about it. And, um, a couple of months later, my, my neighbor, who was a good buddy of mine, uh, we were having a chat one day and he told me that he opened up an E-Trade account. And that was kind of the first, you know, eye to eye, someone like me 
who I knew was, you know, starting out and was getting into trading. So that piqued my interest a little bit. So, uh, for the next couple of weeks, just asked him what he was doing. He said he opened up an account with like five grand or something like that and was just trying out some things. And so I, I remember I, I went on the computer and I looked at that Tesla stock again and I think it was up like 30 bucks or something like that. And so it finally kind of clicked for me how, how everything, or at least how you could profit from, um, uh, you know, being in financial instruments. And, uh, so I opened up my own E-Trade account with $5,000 and very first day I opened it, I, I bought some Tesla stock <laughs> and, uh, that, that was my foray into, um, getting into trading. Sure. Okay. And just out of curiosity, do you still keep in touch with your neighbor who opened the E-Trade account and did you, do you know how he's going to this day? Oh yeah. Well, he's, he's one of my best friends now. Um, he's going to be my wedding actually. And, uh, so he, he still is in the markets. He, um, not so much anymore. He, he got into the OTC, uh, boom when it was hot and, you know, like many others, it didn't end up so well. And I think he kind of lost the zest for it. And he's, um, uh, vice president at his company. And I think uh, his work demands a little bit more time, um, than he has to give to the markets, but he still does things every now and then and gives me updates like, Hey, I made a couple hundred bucks today. So, right. Okay, cool, cool. So at the time you were really new to this, what was your first move, uh, beside buying Tesla stock and where did you begin learning from? So, I mean, I, I bought Tesla honestly, just because it, it was going up, you know, when you're new, you, you don't know anything. So you only know, you know, every little piece as, as you go. And so it, it was going up. So I was like, okay, I'll buy some, it's probably going to go up some more. And so I bought some Tesla and, and, uh, as far as what I was using, I, I didn't have a, you know, I didn't have any charts. I didn't, I didn't have a, a desktop platform. I used the, the web-based, um, trading platform that E-Trade offers. So I didn't even have L2. I just had level one quotes, you know, the bid and the ask and, uh, didn't, didn't, you know, track news or anything. I think the first, um, research I ever did was on the Yahoo message boards. And, uh, I, I think that's what, that's what I used as my research tool for like six months before I even figured out that there were other ways to, you know, learn about stocks. And so, uh, I found out that, you know, Elon Musk was the CEO of Tesla and he had another company called Solar City. So that was the second stock I bought. And I think I bought that at 28 bucks. And, uh, you know, at this point I only had, you know, a couple thousand dollars I was working with, so I wasn't buying much, but things were going up at that time. So, uh, I, I just bought things that were going up and it, it seemed to work at the beginning. <laughs> okay. So, would you say you had some sort of beginner's luck for that first maybe six months to a year that you were trading? Uh, one hundred percent. And and you know it's it's funny because I think one of the challenges today after you trade, it's it's kind of like that fork in the road where when you don't know anything, there there's no noise to um prohibit you from making decisions if that makes sense. Like. You don't know what to look at or what things could be red flags, fundamentals, you know, trading volume, et cetera. You just, everything is very, very simple. But as you learn more, especially as a new trader, you tend to want to use everything to make decisions and it ends up actually hampering your decision-making skills. So at the beginning, I think that's why a lot of people have beginner's luck is because they just don't know any better. Yeah, I think that's really well said and I can totally relate because it kind of feels like the more you learn, sometimes it feels like the less you know. Right. I know there's a quote that goes something along those lines. I probably just butchered it, but um, you get the point. Um, so, Jesse, you have to share with us your story about trading the marijuana boom. I think that was maybe around end of 2014. Um, it's a hell of a story. If you could, start from the start and walk us through it. Yeah, sure, 100%. Um, it's it's not a very cheery story I like to tell, but um, it's uh, it was a great learning experience and it was fun. And uh, there were some cool things that happened during it. But, uh, you know, I, I I think I had I had traded biotech and things of that nature along with Tesla because that was hot, you know, in uh, fall of 2013. And I had just gotten on Twitter and um, I, I had found a group of people that, 
you know, we're exclusively trading these marijuana stocks and, uh, the here, here's how it happened. So I had had some success, um, trading those early stocks with Tesla and, you know, solar city. And so I ended up just wiring more money into my account. Cause I figured the more, you know, money I had, the more I could do with it. And so at, I think at, at the beginning I had wired $30,000 in, which was my complete life savings at that point. Um, uh, you know, outside of your rainy day funds and et cetera. That was just my savings account. I said, screw it. I'm throwing it all in. And uh, I, I had gone in big on Omer at the time because it, it was having a, it was having a run and um, it, it absolutely tanked on me. I think I probably bought that absolute complete top and uh, lost like $10,000 and I really didn't know what to do. And so, uh, and it's again be, beginner's luck. I I saw a stock um, OXBT, which was like oxygen biotherapeutics, and uh, it had a couple of good days in a row. And so I, I literally threw my entire account into that. And I think it was like four bucks at the time, and I bought you know eight thousand shares or something like that. And uh, <laughs> it ended up going up to like eleven or twelve bucks in the next forty eight hours. And uh, to me, it it was a it was a huge win, you know. Um, and at that time, I was under the PDT rule, and so I bought it, and I couldn't sell it for three days. I didn't end up selling it till um, three days later, and it was like seven or eight bucks. But so what I did is after after that trade, I quit my job and uh, said, you know what, I'm going to trade full time. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Um, and uh, so at that point, I made a couple of bad trades, and I had cut my account in half, and I was back down to thirty grand again. And that's when I ran into the the marijuana stocks, and uh, I ended up, you know, doing the same thing. Screw it, I'm just going to go all in on marijuana stocks. And I kid you not, the next day after I put my account in there, they all got cut in half by fifty percent. And uh, I, I didn't know it at the time, but it was just right when marijuana stocks were catching on in OTC. And so they had that first initial bubble. And then the months after is when, you know, everybody was buying weed stocks in the OTC. And so I took that 50% haircut, didn't sleep for a couple of days. And all of a sudden things just exploded. And, you know, I did a couple of, I, I held some long-term, you know, things that were sub penny that ended up going up to like 30 cents a share. And, uh, I ended up, you know, at the peak, my account was just under a half a million um, at the end of March, beginning of April of uh, 2014. And uh, that that was where I, I thought that I literally knew everything about trading. I, I figured that I had it made. I was going to turn that half million into a couple million, that couple million into 10 million, all in the OTC. Little did I know, you know, that there's certain things that you can't do in the OTC like liquidity problems. You know, uh, a tenth of a penny is is quite a bit of a haircut when you have a hundred thousand dollars in a in a penny stock. Um, so, uh, what ended up happening is I I held those stocks because I thought they were going to bounce back up um, all, all the way down till my account was at like a hundred thousand. And I you know said no big deal. I can I can turn this back into it and. This was right at the peak of the OTC going into the summer and when things absolutely just completely died off. And I was throwing 10, 20 grand at certain stocks and, and taking $5,000, $10,000 haircuts on them as they dropped off. And I mean, I, I think I, I got my account down to like $5,000 um, before I got it back up to my original 30. And, and that's when um, I reached out to uh, Nathan and Michelle at the Investors Live crew and got my head squared on straight. Wow. Okay. That is, uh, that is quite the story. So let's just, let's just break that down a little bit. How long did it take for you to go from, uh, you said your account got cut in half. So I'm presuming it was probably down around the 20 grand mark. How long did it take you to go from that point to actually accumulating half a million dollars? I, it was it was under ninety days. I mean, I I made a hundred grand one month, and I made two hundred grand the next month, and then going into to April, it was you know right at the peak, 
just just under that half a million and and then right there that's when things started to tank and i you know like i said i thought i had it all figured out but little did i know like you, you have to take some profits you can't hold on to th things things don't always go up you know they can only go up for so long and i learned that the hard way absolutely so then on the other side how long did it take for you to actually lose that money until you went back down to just five grand? Less than 90 days. Less than 90 days. So, how did you handle this? Like, were you in shock at all? Because I can tell you, if I made 500 grand in the next couple months and then lost it just as quickly, I'd be devastated. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it, and it's funny too, because I had an old um, college coach that I'm still friends with and we were having, um, uh, he drinks coffee. I drink energy drinks, but we just met for coffee and, uh, we were talking and he asked me what I was up to. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in the stock market, even though I was, you know, buying weed stocks. And he's like, Oh, I had a friend who did that once and he made a half a million dollars and lost it just as fast. And I, I kid you not. I was like, Oh, that that's not going to happen to me. I'm, I'm smart. Quote unquote. I know what I'm doing. And, uh, so when it happened, I was like, I can't, I can't friggin' believe this. It, I let it happen. And, uh, I, I was pretty stressed out. I mean, I, th I think I lost probably about 15, 20 pounds. You know, I, I was going through like a can of chew, um, and probably two cans of chew a day. I don't know. I, I lived off of, of chew and energy drinks. I couldn't sleep. And, uh, you know, it was kind of at that point where I was continually whittling away at my count where, you know, I just, I just said, Hey, I, I gotta do, I gotta do something different. You know, I got to completely change the way I think because this obviously is not working. And so the first thing I did was I reached out to the person who in the background was telling me and the other people I was trading with that this is not sustainable. And that, and that was Nathan, you know, Mashad uh, at Investors Live. And I, I, we had some heated exchanges too on uh, on Twitter a couple of times. You know, I was cussing him out because he was saying, hey, man, you better take some profits. This thing isn't going to go anywhere. You know, the top is coming. And I kept on telling me he didn't know what he was talking about. And I, and I didn't know his history. I didn't know he'd been where I had been. So he'd, he'd learned the hard way as well. And uh, so as soon as I decided to make a decision, you know, I, I sent him an email and said, hey, man, I, I just want to know, despite our past, if, uh, if you'd help me out. I'm, I hit a brick wall, dude. I need, I need to learn. And uh, he, you know, he open arms said, yeah, man, we'd love to have you, love to help you out. Just let me know what I can do. So I joined and, and through Nate, um, I met Michelle and that's really where I found my home was in the swing room, um, at trade on the fly. Okay. Yeah. And in previous conversations, you have mentioned to me that Michelle Koenig, uh, who was also on the podcast, uh, on episode 44. So if anyone listening wants to check that out, a uh, really good interview. Um, you mentioned to me in the past that she's probably been the most influential in your development as a trader. If you had to narrow it down to just a few things, what are some of the key lessons you picked up from Michelle and maybe even some of the lessons that actually helped you get back on track? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think the, the first thing was is that she she promoted a, a very um, encouraging learning environment for me. So, I mean, we, we all know that, you know, traders have some of the most sensitive egos, you know, when it comes to trading and ideas and whether they're right or wrong. And Michelle really encouraged me because when I got into her room, um, I, you know, I just sat and watched for a couple of weeks and she sent me a DM that said, Hey, you know, what, what's going on? How are you doing? I haven't seen you post anything. Do you have any ideas you'd like to share? And so she kept pushing me and pushing me and pushing me to, to post ideas and, through that, I developed a you know a confidence in trying to develop and find ideas on my own. And um, you know, once I I got into finding out what chart patterns and setups and things worked for me, you know, she helped kind of put in that foundation. And, and I think the biggest thing on top of that is that, and, and you've talked to Michelle too. She's the sweetest sweetest person on the planet, but. That lady trades with zero emotion whatsoever. She's a robot. And it, not a lot of people that I know in the trading community are like that. And so that's one of the things that she consistently helps me out with is that, you know, it, it, you're either right or you're right out. The idea is going to work or it's not, you know, don't try to be right. Try to make money. Um, and she's helped me 
get my emotions in check. Um, and the, the other person that's helped me do that is uh, Tom Canfield, who's another mod in the room. And he's th- those two have probably made the most impact on my trading career. Oh, that's really good to hear. So just before we move into more about how you trade uh, these days, I think it'd be valuable for listeners if we highlight this, um, and you kind of touched on it right at the beginning, uh, that you currently do have a full-time job. So I'd like to ask you, how do you juggle trading and a full-time job? Is there any challenges that come with that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there are because when when the job calls, you know, you have to put trading on hold. And that's, you know, I think that's one of the, the biggest things that a lot of new people struggle with. They want to go trade full-time. They want to go trade full-time. And that's the biggest thing I learned about myself when I when I did quit my job was that I wasn't mentally or emotionally ready to have the pressure of trading be my only source of income. Um, and, and I think that's why I was making emotional trading decisions the way I was. And that's, you know, one of the things that a, a lot of guys like Modern Rock and Nate um, and some of the others preach is that, you know, when you're starting out, you want to have a job to build your bank account and pay your bills so you can trade. And, uh, you know, they have some certain guidelines that they have in, in their um, in their website about what you should probably do before you go full time. And I agree with 100 percent. And that's one of the things that I've, I've been able to do as I've had a job is that I've been able to learn how to actually trade and trade properly and not trade all with emotions because, you know, my source of income is my job and not my trading. And I think that's one of the number one reasons people blow up is because they try to do this full time too early and they're just not mentally or they haven't mastered their emotions enough yet to be able to handle that. And so trading with a, with a job, um, it actually, for me it is a little bit easier because, um, I don't have that stress of where my money's coming from. I know where it's at and I'm able to build my bank account and, and build my stake. Um, while I'm trading. And so the challenges are, you know, unless you have access to a mobile app or you're in front of a computer all day and whether it's work equipment or your own personal equipment that dictates, you know, how much time you get in front of the screen. But for a while there, you know, I only had a morning uh, or an hour in the morning in pre-market and an hour in the afternoon at close. And so I would trade, I would look for setups the night before, um, and I'd trade them if they, if they were set up properly in, in pre-market and maybe a couple minutes into the open. Uh, and then I'd shut down for the day and I'd, I'd work. And then on my lunch in the afternoon, uh, I'd fire up my, my laptop and I'd open it up and uh, see if there were any afternoon setups. And, and that would be my trades. And so for a while, I was only doing one or two trades a day. Um, and now, you know, I work from home. Uh, my schedule's calmed down a little bit. So I'm able to spend... Um, quite a bit more time in front of the computer and so there's a better balance okay okay and are you still is it still a goal of yours to go full-time trading again sometime soon or is you not are you not as concerned about that anymore no it it is it's it's a it's a goal and you know soon is a relative word um and i i think everybody's going to be different. You know, I, I have a couple of buddies who are in their early twenties that are trading full time and absolutely killing it. And, um, I, I just wasn't ready for that. So for me, it's just going to be to a point where financially I feel a hundred percent comfortable doing it. Um, and for everybody that's different. A lot of people recommend having two years salary plus a rainy day fund, you know, and at least 20 to $30,000 in your trading. Um, your trading account before you start. Um, for me, it's just going to be a point where I have some certain numbers in mind financially where I want to be, where I would feel comfortable trading full time. And quite frankly, I, I, I like my balance right now. Um, I have a really good split between work, life, and trading to where I'm comfortable where it's at right now. But if I'm not trading full time in the next, I would say probably three or four years, then so- something's wrong. Okay. Okay. Sure. Now that's really interesting to get your your take on that. I really appreciate you you sharing that with us. So let's shift this conversation to how you're trading these days and how you're navigating your way through the market. So Jesse, how would you describe or summarize your trading approach? 
Um, it's a good question. Um, I, I think the, we, we talked about it, you know, in another conversation, but there, there's not really, I'm not a day trader and I'm not a swing trader. I do kind of a mix of both. And I, I think that's one of the things that, again, a lot of new traders try to do is they try to compartmentalize their trading into one style because they see, you know, all these, these people that you emulate, which is very easy to do when you, you know, are getting into, uh, financial Twitter, uh, that's where a lot of people, you know, start and learn about things. And, and that's one of the things that I, you know, I wanted to make clear is that I, I don't trade a huge account. I'm not a guy that makes, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars in a day. I have days where I make a couple grand and, you know, that's an awesome day for me. And I have days where, you know, I make a couple hundred bucks and uh, I'm just trying to, I just want to be consistent for a long period of time. Um, because I tried doing the, you know, swing for the fences, everything. And sometimes it works, but when it doesn't, it doesn't. And emotionally it'll blow you out real quick. So as far as my trading goes right now, um, you know, I, I, I tend to prefer to, to swing trade. Um, and I, I like short term swings a little bit better. And when I say that anywhere from three days to a, a week, um, obviously in this market, the, the time frame can be a lot shorter than that. And then I also do some day trading as well. And what I do is a lot of people do scans every night. And um, I used to do that, but it was a little bit too much noise for me. So now I just do scans on the weekend and I look for the best setups on a larger time frame. So I'm not focused on the minutia that's going on, you know, on a five or a 15 minute candle. Um, granted, there's some great opportunities within those ranges, but on the weekend, I can find 20 ideas and pick out the 10 best setups. And that, out of that, I can pick four long setups and four short setups that I like for the week. And uh, I plug my alerts into my system, get my charts up and my watch list. And so I've got, you know, the idea set on the screen plus the sub ideas um, and the alerts. And really after that, it's just about, you know, when the alert goes off, then I'm watching a little bit closer. So, for me, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more automated and I like it that way because with work, I can't be watching every tick. Um, and so if, if an idea is working, literally one of the hardest things I'm having, um, a challenge doing it is letting it work. I like to take profits quick, especially in this market. And so that's one of the things I'm working on is holding things longer. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I would just say it's it's a pretty good mix of holding things anywhere from three to five days to, you know, sometimes, you know, an hour or two, uh, depending on the setup. Okay, okay, cool. So if I understood that correctly, you might only be trading around uh, tracking, sorry, about eight stocks each week. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, all right, cool. So. When you're reading charts, what time frames are you analyzing? Like, have you found a sweet spot? You mentioned that you don't watch, you know, minute uh, intraday charts, like, you know, minutely charts and 15 minute charts. What time frames are you analyzing? Yeah. So it, it I, I start out looking at the daily. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I've, I've learned um, from a couple different traders is so like Michelle, she's a breakout trader. She likes stocks that are breaking out and that's when she likes um, to buy them on the long side. And on the short side, she likes to buy them when they break down through um, the support levels. Um, and Tom Canfield, um, one of the other guys uh, that I speak with a lot, he also he, he won't touch anything unless it's based above its 50 and 200 day uh, moving average. And for me, I'm a little bit different. On the long side, I like to buy things as close to near to midterm support as I can. That way I have a clear stop if anything, if the trade goes against me. And on the short side, I, I personally, I like to buy things as close to uh, the top end resistance as I can. So again, I've got a clear line. So what I do is I look at the daily um, and then for the four that I pick out on the long and the short side that I want to focus on, I zoom the chart out and I look at the weekly and monthly so I can see the bigger picture. And then depending on what the market's doing, um, I, I just kind of stock my entry. And typically when I do an entry, it, it's a, I mean, for most people, it's extremely small size. Like I might pick up a, a couple hundred to 500 shares to start. And I do that because 
if a trade goes against me, I can mitigate my risk with minimal damage whatsoever. And if the trade starts to work out, then I've got a good start and I can start scaling in. And that's one of the things that um, I do now that I didn't used to do is I scale in. Before, I would just you know, essentially throw everything I could um, right at the beginning and it either worked or it didn't. Uh, now, um, I scale in typically in four or, or five scales um, before I have a full position. And that's really helped out my trade management quite a bit. And Nate helped me out with that too. So let's talk about that a little more, um, about how you do manage trades. Because I know something many newer traders struggle with is knowing when to get out. Right. So what's your thought process for actually managing trades and adding to positions and then taking a profit or a loss at the end? Like, How do you decide when to scale into a position? Um, it's a good question. So if the trades going, going for me, let's say, you know, I have a good entry, it's near support and I, you know, I, some of the other indicators I use are, are, I use slow stocks quite a bit. Um, and I, I typically like to buy when slow stocks are as, as close to being on the long side, as close to being oversold as I can. And that's typically when it's near support and it's oversold. That's typically where I like to do my entry. And so uh, I'll start there. And if it starts working out, um, I'll, I'll add right away. Uh, and what I like to do is if I like to wait for a retest. And if it retests and holds, then I'll, I'll scale in again. Um, if it doesn't retest and it just keeps working, then I'll just keep adding until it doesn't. And um, typically, that that's when I start to zoom in a little bit on the trade. Um, just to manage it a little bit better. So instead of looking at the daily or the weekly, I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit and look at the hourly and the 15-minute chart um, to see if I see anything that would cause me alarm, et cetera. Um, and I, you know, when I first started out, I, I was trying to look at one-minute and two-minute charts, and uh, it was just it was too, way too much noise for me, and I would spook myself out. And so now I zoom out um, and look at the bigger picture. And uh, when I scale in. Um, and I've got full position um, and the trade's working, then typically right at 3%, um, I'll take a, I'll take a, one of my scales off. And that's what I do to pay for the trade and get a little bit of house's money in the pot. Uh, and then the next points are typically 5%. And 5% is, is really the sweet spot because you can grow a small account really fast with 5% trades consistently. Um, and then... Uh, and if it holds five percent, then I'll leave, I'll leave it on um, as long as it works. And if it dips below, or looks like it's going to dip below five percent, then I'll take some off and leave just either a quarter or a fifth of the position on, depending on what the size in was. Okay. And when you say you hold on to it for as long as it works, um, how long might you be holding that for? Like, is it, could it go on for like maybe a couple of weeks? And would you just trail a stop behind your, you know, the price by? however much or how are you managing that part of it well and that that's one of the things that I, i'm trying to learn to um add into you know how i manage trades is it's not how they open it's how they close so if a if a stock closes strong um and when i say strong that uh, it's not it doesn't have to close at high high days but it has to close you know i mean within five to ten percent of the high day um and uh, when i say that and I'm talking about the whole move. So if it moved 50 cents, it's got to close within you know five to 10 cents of the high a day. Um, then I'll then I'll keep it on. And if it, if it has a weak close, then I, I won't hold it overnight, especially in this tape, because you never know what's going to happen overnight. And the gaps up and down have been enough to drive a person crazy. So lately, they've just been um, day in a couple of overnight trades. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So. Uh, all right, so where were we? Um, from my understanding, there are two types of setups that you trade or really like to focus on uh, in particular. Could you share some insight on uh, these two setups? Yeah, sure. So um, typically on the long side, I'm, I'm having good success, I would say. Um, well, I mean, I've, I've been focusing on biotech kind of just like everybody else. And really what I've been doing is 
I guess you call, you call it range trading. It's I don't think it's a new term. That's just what I call it. And so I find stocks that are are trading within a range. And, and Modern Rock talks about this a lot. Um, you know, something that's been bouncing between let's say nine and ten bucks for hours or days, um, et cetera. Um, and these biotechs have been finding. Uh, a nice range um, after this dip when it's you know when IVB has been going from 300 to 320 or 340 there's been really good range in there so essentially I just focused on a couple of biotechs that have pretty consistent range and I'll short them at the top of the range and cover at the bottom and I'll long at the bottom and and uh, sell you know at the top and I, I've done that on a couple where it's it's worked and I've Essentially, I just keep doing it until it doesn't work anymore. The challenge is, is when it when it doesn't work, my I guess my ego, my stubbornness gets in the way, and that's you know we were talking earlier about how I, I've been I've been pretty consistent about having four or five green days in a row, and then I have one stubborn day where I get spanked, and so that's one of the things I'm trying to avoid. But those range trades, I've I've been having um, pretty consistent success with. Uh, and then the other one is um, shorting these uh, the the sector rotation. So right now it's um, the solars. There's a lot of money going into solars, and they got really hot really quick. And so um, I and I try not to short um, the crowded trades. And so a lot of people are focused on soon and so or or Sun Edison and, and Solar City. And I've been trying to focus on the outliers that are less crowded trades because then the moves are a little bit more natural, whereas the ebbs and flows in these crowded trades are, are a little bit more forced and I don't have a very good handle on them. So on these outliers, you know, they get hot and they peak out and I'm just looking at the chart and finding out where, where they should have um, quite a bit of resistance at and I'll short them and, and they fade off. And again, that's another thing that's, I've been finding some consistent um, success with, and prior to that, it was um, semiconductors, and prior to that, it was China names, and prior to that, it was biotech. Okay, but you're trading the same type of setup regardless of the sector, right? 100%. Okay, so I'd like to ask you then, you, you can now say that you, you know, these are my two high probability setups, and you can say that with confidence, what motions did you go through to identify these as good quality setups? Like, how did you arrive at this point? Um, that I mean, the the only logical answer that makes sense is that you you make a lot of mistakes. You try out a lot of setups until you find ones that work consistently for you. And for me, it, it was it was it was quite a natural um, come to Jesus moment. I guess is. You know, when I got into charting, I I, I scanned everything. I mean, I, when I did scans, I would scan every night and I'd look at, you know, 500, 2,000 charts a night, every night, because I just figured the more you did, the more you learned. And through that process, you know, my, my stock watch list went from having 50 to 60 stocks I was trying to watch to where it's at now, where I've got, you know, a, a 20 subset and eight real ideas. And it, it came from seeing the same patterns over and over again. And then looking back at, at my trade log and seeing which ones I was the most successful at. And it's kind of just putting two and two together. These are the ones that have worked the most for me. And they're also the ones that I identify on my scans the most. So for right now, my goal is just to get really consistent at one thing. And that's my high probability setups. And then, you know, once that becomes a little bit more robotic and automated, I can, you know, try to learn some other tricks. Okay. I know that you have trading rules in place to keep you on track uh, with your trading. How systematic and strict are these rules and what do they focus on? Are these rules mainly for um, sort of position sizing and risk management or are these rules that actually uh, help you identify the setups and state these are the setups I trade. And I guess the second part to the question is, what sort of variance um, do these rules allow for in your trading decisions? Um, that, that's a great question. And 100% the rules are in place to protect me from myself. Um, 
and and that's really how I, I came up with the rules. And I, when I did my trade review for the year, um, the the number one losing trade and my biggest losses came from when I had a it, it, it came, and it all came on the short side. Um, I never did it on the long side, and I don't know why, but always on the short side. Um, I would I would fight a trend. I would go in with a plan. I'd have a stop set with a max loss risk, and it would ju- it, you know it would go through my stop, and I'd bump my stop up another couple cents, and I'd I'd add a little bit, and I'd do the same thing over and over again until it got to the point where I don't even know how I got there, and I just closed the trade out. So the rules are to protect me from myself, and so when I when I go into a trade, I have. Um, my soft stop and my hard stop. And typically they're not very far from each other. And that's because of what I just said. I tend to be a little bit stubborn because I want to be right. Um, and that's obviously not how you want to trade. You want to make money. So, uh, my max loss is 1% of the trade. And a lot of people will say that's stupid or you're not giving it enough room, but I don't care because that works for me. So, you know, if, if I've got, a $500 trade on my max loss is five bucks. And if I've got a 5,000 trade on, you know, it's 50 bucks. And that, again, that's because I know myself and I'm protecting me from getting myself into a position that I can't work out of. Um, and that's, that's really the, the rule is that I have a 1% max loss and I have a soft stop and the hard stop. And before I get into the trade, um, or I'm sorry, immediately after I enter my order, I already enter the hard stop in so I don't leave myself, you know, the freedom to change that. Um, it's set, it's set in stone. And what that's allowed me to do is remove a little bit more emotion from my trade because now it's automated and I have no control over it. All right, let's just take a brief moment to thank our sponsor for this week's episode. And our sponsor is Trading Technologies. Trading Technologies is an industry-leading platform for those actively trading futures. Now, there's a few reasons for this. Through the TT platform, they provide flexible workspaces, allowing you to arrange your screen or screens the exact way you want it, with an extensive range of charting tools and customizable widgets. With the TT platform, you also have Go Anywhere access. The entire platform is cloud-based, meaning no client-side software is required And you can access this from virtually anywhere on any device. You'll also achieve remarkable execution speeds with your trades. Latency is reduced to mere microseconds through Trading Technologies co-located servers. And the list continues. So don't sleep on it. Go to trade.tt now and sign up for a free trial if you're an active futures trader. You'll get full access to all of this and more, including the proprietary trading technologies tools. Those tools are the ADL, which stands for Algo Design Lab, build and test your own algos with no manual coding required, MD Trader, and Auto Spreader for you spread traders out there. So visit trade.tt now and experience the trading technologies difference. Let's change this up a little bit and um, speak about some more kind of general advice for, for others. So Jesse, you're very active on Twitter and you communicate with many other traders. Uh, plus, you're also a moderator in Michelle's group for Trade on the Fly. What sort of questions do you often get asked most frequently? You know, it's, it, it's a great question. And obviously, because I'm new, I, I have a lot of new people that are asking me questions, you know. And I think it's because, like we talked about earlier, I, I don't throw around huge you know, huge trades. I don't have a hundred thousand dollar account. I'm not making $30,000 a day. And I think that it, I'm a little bit, they can relate a little bit more to, to how I trade and asking me questions. And because I'm so new, um, and I, I think the thing is like the number one question is, you know, how about all these setups? You know, what should I read? What YouTube channels? You know, who should I watch? Or what room should I join? Or what do you think about this setup? And really what I would say to all the new traders is is try to pare away uh, as much of that minutia as you can. Like we talked about keeping it simple. Like 
try not to try and absorb everything at once because there is a vast amount of trading information and resources out there. And as a new trader, you want to go out and gobble it all up. But like you mentioned before, kind of the, the more you try to know, you know, the more it can hurt you. So what, what I would say is for new traders, um, you know, they're, they're always asking about, you know, what should I do next? Well, you got to come up with a plan. And so many people come into this thing just like I did. We're like, okay, I've got cash. I opened up an account. Let me start trading. And there's so much that needs to happen between A, I want to be a trader to, okay, I'm going to make my first trade. And I think no one focuses on that gap in their path. They all focus on, okay, I've got money. I want to make a trade. What should I trade? And that's, it's just too fast. There's so much that they can do. And, uh, you know, finding somebody that they can work with, they can ask questions to, and that's not easy because there's not a lot of people out there that want to do that for free, you know? So trying to find someone and not just anyone, but the right person for you is that's half the battle when you're getting started because trading is pretty much a solo game. Unless you get on with a prop firm and you're trading in an office with somebody, um, you're doing it by yourself. There's no class or anything. So finding someone that'll help you and, you know, joining a chat room, you know, starting one of the services, a lot of people talk trash about it. You know, there's a lot of guff about it online. Even I talk trash about it because there are some ridiculous, you know, paid chat rooms out there that are just extremely detrimental to the financial, um, the, the fin twit financial Twitter in general. But there's ones out there that, I mean, of course I, I would recommend paying a thousand bucks for a year of having access to people who have been doing this for 10 to 20 years. That was the best thing I ever did. If I didn't do that, I would probably still be burning money in the OTCs. So I a hundred percent promote people joining. Now here's the key, the right chat room, because not all of them are going to be the right one. Um, so invest in that education. Once you've gotten from A to B and you're ready to make a trade, you know, get in a chat room and get in there and just watch for two, three weeks, you know, study the materials that are available to you. Um, don't just go out there, you know, blazing guns because you get smacked real hard. Um, eventually, you know, you could have beginner's luck right away, but there's, you know, there, there's two types of traders. Th those who have experienced a life changing loss and those who will, you know, and, and that's it. Those are the only two. If you haven't experienced a big loss yet, you will. And that's the wake up call. So I would, the number one question I get is what do I do to get started? And those, those are the things that I typically end up telling people is, you know, invest in yourself. Yeah. I think you brought up a lot of really great points there. So yeah, thank you very much. That was a brilliant answer. Now stepping away from the markets, there's something else in your life, which I know you're extremely passionate about, and that's the well being of animals. So what are some of the issues you feel most strongly about and what would you like to bring greater awareness to? Oh yeah, man. I, I appreciate you asking that. Um, and that's, uh, it's funny you say that because half the emails I get are about, you know, animal awareness, animal cruelty. You know, I get emails. I, I got an awesome email from a guy that was getting ready. Him and his girlfriend were getting ready to adopt their first dog and they wanted to, you know, get a puppy. And, uh, I told him, you know, puppies are typically adopted out first. Um, they have no problem getting adopted. And the ones that have the hardest time getting adopted are dark colored senior dogs. And they, they ended up getting, you know, an older dog, which is absolutely awesome. That was, you know, great, great for me to read. And they absolutely adore their new, their new pup. So, um, you know, I just have always had an extremely huge soft spot for animals and, uh, the the biggest reason is is because you know they're they're oftentimes they they don't have a choice in their surroundings. See, human beings they have a choice. They always have a choice no matter what. I don't I, I honestly don't care 
what anybody says, well, they were forced into this, they're a product of their surroundings. I firmly believe that a person is a product of themselves. And no matter what, at the end of the day, the thing that separates us from everything else on this planet is that we always have a cognitive choice about what we do. Whereas animals don't. They don't choose who they go home with. They don't choose who they get sold to on Craigslist. They don't choose what they're bred for. And I just, I think that things are e extremely imbalanced right now in the way that we view an, an animal's life. And currently, you know, it's very easy for people to, you know, just be out of sight, out of mind. You know, you, you go to the store and you buy some Tyson chicken breasts or whatever, and, you know, you don't know where it came from, but little do you know that like, you know, baby chicks are thrown into crushers if they're males because they can't use them to lay eggs or they've got machines that rip the beaks off the chickens so they don't because they're kept in such close proximity of each other in those factory farms they, they peck each other um, and so they rip the beaks off them um, so they don't peck each other and uh, you know those are just things you don't think about and so I just felt that if I had an opportunity to reach a, a broad audience with just kind of hey Th this is happening whether you want to see it or not i'm going to throw it out there i hope you look at it and you know maybe think about some of the decisions um or or even even better you know if you see something happening you know make ha have action you know do something about it and that's you know one of the things a lot of people don't know what animal abuse is or how to recognize it um, or even how to rescue a dog or a cat properly. So I just, you know, I, I couldn't go a day without bringing it up just because it really means a lot to me. And quite frankly, that's why w one of the driving factors of me getting into trading was because I wanted to open up, you know, a fully functional no-kill animal shelter where dogs could come and they could just live out the rest of their days there if they had to. Um, and I couldn't do that, you know, with a job. So I had to f figure out another way to make money and you know, just happen to be trading stocks. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a really great cause and motive for, for getting into trade. And I, I think that's awesome. So what's your involvement? Like what sort of actions are you taking like on sort of an ongoing basis? Um, are you involved with any causes or anything like that? Yeah, so when I was in Seattle, I used to volunteer at the animal shelter. Um, I, I donate to the animal shelter. I donate to the ASPCA. Um, obviously, I sign every petition that I can get my hands on. Um, and then, it, it, really, I'm kind of reaching max bandwidth just with that. Once I get some more time, there's some other projects I'd like to get involved in. Uh, I'm getting ready to do um, on Twitter. Actually, I'm, I'm putting together um, not a fundraiser, but a drive. Um, to where uh, people can donate um, to a general uh, fund, whether it be uh, money or um, you know dog food, cat food, guinea pig food, blankets, towels, whatever, and we'll try and get it sourced out to the local shelters that that need assistance the most. Uh, and then, other than that, you know, uh, me and uh, the future uh, Mrs. Psycho. Um, we've, you know, we've made some, some dietary changes over the last year or two, uh, to be more conscious of what we're putting in our bodies. Uh, you know, we're not hundred percent meat free yet. Um, and you and I have talked about that. It's something that, you know, we'd, we'd like to try a hundred percent, but we de we get, I would say 99% of, of what we eat that comes from, um, animals comes from, uh, local farming, um, and is sourced, you know, from an organic location where they, you know, free range, um, non-GMO, uh, humane um, slaughter. Uh, that's what you want to call it. You know, they're put down humanely. They live a great life. And, uh, you know, we're, we're working on being completely dairy free. Um, we're, we're getting ready to go. Uh, what is it? Um, I can't remember what it's called. I always want to say Episcopalian, but that's that's a religion. Um where it's just, we're just doing seafood. Um, so like fish and, you know, um, clams, you know, crab, et cetera. And then I think, um, later this year is where we're, we're going to try the completely vegetarian route. And then next year, um, we actually have it on the calendar to try to go vegan for a little bit and see, see if we can handle it. 
Okay, sure. Yeah, you'll have to keep us posted on how you go with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's also something I've been given a bit of thought to as well in recent times is actually just sort of reducing the amount of meat that we do consume because we do eat an unnecessary amount of meat. Right. You know, I'm obviously generalizing here, but for the most of us, um, I actually watched a documentary a few weeks ago uh, called Cowspiracy. Yeah. Actually a really solid documentary. Um, doesn't even focus so much on the cruelty of animals, but just about the uh, impact of sort of uh, farming on the environment. It was really interesting. Not something I'd normally watch, but um, yeah, I'm glad I did. It was a real eye-opener. So yeah. So, I mean, you've outlined a few issues here. I don't know what the proper term is, but actually having uh, animals as pets where they're not treated right as well as the actual farming of animals. So what needs to be put in place for some of these issues to be either fixed or reduced or resolved in some way? That's a great question. And I, I personally, I think that the, the number one thing that can be changed is, you know, um, having harsher punishment for animal cruelty because, you know, all over the country and you can look up um, in each uh uh, jurisdiction uh, of each state and each, each district, they all have different animal cruelty laws. And in some states, like, you know, it's a $50 fine and, uh, you know, that's it. And in, in some states, like, like Washington um, is getting really good. Oregon's getting better. Um, they have some of the, the stiffest uh, animal cruelty fines. And, you know, that's one of the things that I like to tweet out is when, when people get busted. Um, and I hate to say it, but like places like uh, the UK have some of the worst um, punishment for animal cruelty. But you know, different cultures that you know, you can only do so much. But you know, making a difference is what what we do. Is you know, I, I write to congressmen all the time. You know, just trying to get a real response or even a sit down to talk about you know how that would impact because the studies show that. Um, a high percentage of uh, people who are found abusing animals end up abusing people, uh, and that's one of the things that I try to tweet out or tweet out on uh, Twitter too. So, you know, just simple enough is is signing something on PETA or ASPCA or um, you know any kind of uh, animal cruelty or supporting um, the ethical treatment of animals, where it sends an automated letter to. Um, your congressman, that actually makes a difference. A lot of people don't think it does, but they hit a certain amount of signatures and they, you know, they have to do something um, in, in response. And, and even if it's just, hey, we're writing a bill, um, it's a step in the right direction. So I, I think that, you know, they need to step up their game when it comes to punishing people who get their kicks, you know, treating animals like crap. Okay. So if someone listening right now wants to do something to help. Uh, you mentioned there, you know, signing petitions and that sort of thing online. Um, but is there anything else that would help? Like, what's the best way that they could do this? Oh, yeah. No, the the easiest and simplest way for for people to actually help make a difference is to donate, whether it be money or goods, to their local animal shelter. Because in the United States, animal shelters are extremely and severely underfunded. And so five bucks like literally helps e even a dollar. If you just walk there, you know, once a month and handed them a buck, that helps. Um, because they have, the thing about it is, you know, puppy mills are an epidemic in the United States. Well, I mean, just breeding mills in general. And so pets are overbred to the point where, you know, it, if they're not sold, they're given away or just let go, you know, as and so many strays come in. Um, and they just don't have the capacity. And that's why, you know, the, the unfortunate ending for a lot of them is being euthanized as, as, at a shelter uh, because they don't have the resources to keep them alive. And so if people could donate, um, you know, just a little bit, I think the ASPCA is like 18 bucks a month. That's like one of the donorship programs. And a little bit goes a long way, especially if it's done on a mass scale. No doubt, no doubt. Well, I mean, I think it's an awesome cause you're, you're getting behind here and I hope, you know, a lot of others join you and I'm glad we could bring some awareness to this. Is there anything you'd like to add before we, we close this out or do you think we've covered pretty much everything? 
for now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for now. Yeah, I think we've covered it. Um, unless you know you had anything else you wanted to ask me, um, I, f- I feel good about this. Okay, excellent. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think that'll that'll do us for now. So, do you want to share with listeners where they can go to find out more about you? Maybe your Twitter handle, and I know you had a blog at one point. Are you still um, keeping this up to date? Yeah. So, um, you know, the Twitter handle is at Psycho on Wall Street, and the street is with an S T. Um, and, uh, you know, you can go to trade on the fly.com, um, send Michelle an email, or you can send me an email at psycho on wall street, all spelled out at gmail.com. And, uh, I, you know, I never turned away a question. Um, I typically answer emails on the weekend. Um, so if you shoot me an email, be more than happy to reply the best that I can. And, uh, the the blog is active. Um, when when my bandwidth got maxed, I wasn't able to post on it as much. But um, I actually, I got a pretty cool email from a buddy of mine um, that uh, he he's he's holding me accountable. And so uh, um, I think at the uh, towards the end of this month, um, I'm going to start doing a, a weekly recap on the blog. Um, nothing major, just thoughts um, and reflection about how the week went and. You know, go from there. Okay. And what's the link to that one? Um, it's psychoonwallstreet.wordpress.com. Okay. And straight ST or the full word? I believe it's the full word. It's been so long that I, for, I forgot about it. <laughs> Easy um, done. Easy yeah, done. it's it's psychoonwallstreet.wordpress.com. Okay. Well, I'll put a link to it in the show notes anyway. And I'm also going to add... Um, Actually, two things I'm going to add. First one is if you do want to find out more about Michelle's trade on the fly, uh, you can just go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash offshore. And for full disclosure, that is an affiliate link. So if you do decide to sign up, I think there may even be a free trial on the site. But if you do sign up and pay for any of the services or products, I will receive a small kickback, but the price is not inflated for me to be compensated. So um, you know, if you use an affiliate link, it's a really good way to support the podcast. Uh, that's just chatwithtraders.com forward slash offshore uh, to find out more about Trade on the Fly where uh, Jesse is a moderator there also. And the second thing I was going to add, if you have any questions for Jesse, obviously you can email him and contact him on Twitter, but you can also leave a comment on the website. So at chatwithtraders.com forward slash 57 just scroll to the bottom of the page and leave a question in the comments area. And uh, both Jesse and I will be watching that pretty closely and um, answer any questions that come through. So it's a good way just to have everything out there in the open. All right, Jesse, well, I really appreciate you coming on and um, you know learning more about you and your trading and um, everything you're doing. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it, man. Have a good evening and let's talk again soon. Yeah, thanks again, Aaron. I appreciate it. You've come to the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but don't worry, more great episodes are on the way. To stay updated with each great new episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, and we'd love it if you leave us a rating and review. We'll see you next time on Chat with Traders.